everybody. It's, I'm excited to have Rick Nelson and Brandon Mole with us. And uh, I want to thank Tyler Perry for letting us uh, all gather at his home. There's a bunch of friends behind me. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. So Brandon can only be on for just a couple of minutes. Um, it's actually a snowy day in Utah on uh, January 9th. So uh, some people couldn't make it here. So I thought it would be cool if we did a, a YouTube, not a YouTube, a Zoom video and have Rick and Brandon. So I asked Tyler if he kind of would set this up. Sean and I are living in Missouri, and we've had the opportunity during the holidays to come visit our family and friends in Utah. And I was so nervous we were going to miss people that I got a hold of Tyler and said, would you mind hosting at your home so we can get some of the people that we hadn't seen yet. So thanks again, uh, Tyler and everybody for being here. So I thought what we could do is take a couple, a couple of minutes and talk about this crazy little book called Return from Risa. <laughs> and I'm going to assume most of the people here tonight have read the book. I know they've all heard about it. Um, but I wanted to take just a couple of minutes and talk about the book and then um, kind of make an announcement that we're finally to the editing process. Um, Erlin Mull, who I think is probably the most amazing editor in the world. What a blessing it is to have Erlin helping with this book. And of course, the uh, number one fantasy fiction author in the world in his, in his age group, Brandon Mull. So thank you so much, Brandon, for lending a little bit of help with this project. So, Rick, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. Rick Nelson is my co-author in Return from Risa, and also in book two, which we haven't named yet. Um, Rick, can you give everybody kind of a quick overview of Return from Risa? Uh, book one or book two? Book one, and then we'll jump into book okay. two. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, since this is unrehearsed, <laughs> How much time and what were you thinking? Oh, I'll cut you off. Don't worry. All right. I have no problem doing that, Rick. <laughs> so Return to Risa is a project that uh, Phil and I took on after a rather extensive meeting with some dear friends, including Michael Rush. And our original goal was to write something for our kids. Um, I knew I could never get him to read Michael, although I, one of my kids did finally agree to do that. Loved it. So that was kind of the idea, and we just wanted to be able to tell the story of of what was going to happen in the next you know few years, and and we decided to take the approach of using a science fiction format, using a parable uh, way of teaching. So it's it's been fun. It's uh, I mean the book itself has it's based on some true experiences put in parable form. It uh, we had a chance to to weave in some really important doctrine about God's plan of happiness for his children and that he has children all over the universe. We kind of focused on just a handful of characters. Um, we, I'll admit that we started out with 26 point of view characters before early in got a hold of us. But our, our main our main point of view characters are a little boy from Earth and the and um and what happens with his family? We've got a, a family that comes from Risa, which is where, in our account, that's our parabolic name for um, where the ten tribes are living. Um, we have a and their major our major point of view character there is Rainuba, who is the father of a family of a, from the ten tribes. And then we've got another wonderful family. Um, would be Micah and Trava, who are represent the future of what this planet could be. Uh, they live on Risa, which is a trans, which is a an ascending world, which in in scriptural theology we call the terrestrial world. And then we have some really good bad guys, so that may or may not be real. Awesome, awesome, Rick. That was great. So, Brandon. Um, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, it was such an incredible blessing to be introduced to Brandon Mole. And I'm going to confess, I've already told Brandon, I didn't know who he was. I know, it's shocking. But all of my kids knew who he was. <laughs> and 
almost everyone else I know who reads books knew who Brandon Mole was. So what a blessing when we got to meet Brandon Mole and to have him help us figure out how to best tell this story. Um, now, Brandon, your your books are similar, but also very different because your books focus mostly on fantasy fiction. What what made you interested in in wanting to have anything to do with this story? Yeah, I mean, I, I get approached to help people um, make stories all the time, and, and I've never said yes. <laughs> Um, and, and, and the reason I did on, on this one was, um, I felt like there was true things in it. I felt nudged spiritually to help with it. And, and that, and that's why, like, I, like, I, I thought that there was, <sighs> I mean, you, you've got a story where it's suggesting what alien interaction with this world might look like, at least two different alien races. It seems like three different alien races, if you include the Vol, but the Vol are also really just part of one of the races, right? Um, but you've got two different alien races interacting with the world. You've got people going off world. You've got the idea of the lost tribes returning um, through space, which I think, you know, though that might sound like kind of a crazy theory, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that turns out to be part of how it works. And um, it's a... Uh, to, to me, I, I just felt nudged. I felt like there was probably something of value or of, or of truth in it, or, or I wouldn't have gotten involved. Yeah. Well, we appreciate that. And, and we told people many times, there's no way, there's no way this book uh, would have turned out, I, I think as, as well as it did, if it hadn't have been for your influence. And of course, Erlin, and uh, I know Erlin couldn't be here tonight, but she's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, all, all Erlin and I did was we were just trying to shape it more into a fictional narrative, right? Because part, part of the trick of this was it was pulling a lot of firsthand actual stories of things that were known or that had happened and and trying to take those firsthand accounts and present them in a way that was coherent and fictionalized. It was already had was full of really good ideas, but we just tried to help with... Uh, telling the story in his in his really kind of simplifying it like like rick said like 26 point of view characters is too many point of view characters i don't know if you guys write fiction but like, like that's too many that's too many and and so like you uh you can have lots of important characters but it's a lot of point of view characters um and so, so it was just a, it was off it was largely a job of kind of simplifying some things and streamlining some things and all sorts of really interesting stuff was already there. You know, you talk about the point of view characters. I know that Rick brought it up. The thing that was really funny, it was our first meeting with Erlin, and of course you were there. And the first thing she did is she had a stack of loose leaf papers that she had taped them all together, you know, lengthwise. And she had written on all of them and had different colors of highlight. And we walk in and you had this long table and she threw it across the table and it, it covered the entire table. And I thought, wow, what in the heck is this? This is cool. And she says, do you have any idea how many point of view characters you have? This is way too many to tell the story. So I thought it was awesome. And uh, it was definitely a great object lesson because we just had no idea that that many people were talking, telling the story at the same time. So that was a huge, huge lesson to learn and a huge improvement uh, trying to reduce the amount of people that are telling the story. Yeah, I'm sure it was a huge temptation because the story is kind of vast and epic in scope. And one way to do that is to bounce around to lots of point of views. But part of how we make a story coherent is by limiting those point of views so that the reader is with a few characters they get to know a little better and those guys are finding out all the information rather than jumping around to get all the information and it's it's a simple story storytelling idea and maybe even boring to talk about because it's kind of nuts and bolts but 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 it, but it helps if you simplify the point of view characters yeah well our nuts and bolts were not fastened correctly so thanks for helping with that no 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 but it was like the the, the, the fun was getting to know you and the fun was getting to hear a lot of the stories. Um, it, it was like, uh, because it's speculating about what 
could be coming and, and what might be coming and what might be out there. And, and for me in my life, if you rewind about three years, I, I, I thought, I thought, ufos were on the low side of the maybe category you know what i mean i was like yeah maybe but you know like it did not seem very likely it just seemed like and, and honestly it seemed likely partly because i hadn't even thought hard about it it just seemed too silly to think hard about it if that makes sense and like yeah. uh after i heard some testimonials and after i heard some stories now i'm way on the other side right yeah it's probably yes there's probably stuff like that going on which I, I wouldn't, if you talked to me five years ago, I said, I would never swing in that direction, but, but here I am, you know. Well, you, you gave an incredible um, presentation at our book launch and you introduced this concept of the maybe table. Can you quickly talk about that again? You're, yeah, you're, that might be worth, worth sharing. And then, and then I can hop off and let you guys dig yeah, into yeah. the, into the book a little more, okay. but like uh, that's, that's something I've, I've found that can be of great value is sometimes we we want to be able to just say yes or no about something, right? This is true. This isn't true. And sometimes that's not super helpful if you are in search of truth or in search of learning more. What can be more useful than a hard yes or even a hard no? And unless you have the hard yes, right, or you have the hard no, if you don't really have it, there's nothing wrong with maybe, there's nothing wrong with holding a little bit of tension of, well, I, I'm not absolutely sure about this, but I've got some evidence that says, yes, I have some evidence that says, you know, maybe I have some reasons not to believe it. Maybe I have some reasons to believe it. But um, I have learned that as I open up, oh, maybe, then I can let some ideas in. And if as you let the ideas in, you just see if they keep stacking up. Sometimes if you say maybe, um you get surprised because now that you've said maybe, now that you've opened up to the possibility, sometimes a lot of evidence will start stacking up on top of that. And I think, I, in fact, I think that's part of how God does his line upon line teaching to us is as we are open to receive new information, as we're willing to say maybe instead of no, um, there are certain places that maybe we wouldn't have supposed on our own. There, there might be truth. But now that now that we have this open mind, and, and are willing to say, well, maybe I'll, I'll entertain it. Yeah, send it my way. Sometimes things really stack up and something that was a maybe no becomes a maybe yes. Or maybe a, you get so much data on a certain maybe that you just move it over to the yes table. Um, or sometimes you, you you have enough experiences. You're like, you know what? I think this one's a no. And you move it over to the no table. Um, but like uh, this idea on things like aliens where it's not super definitive and it's hard, hard to get like this certain answer. There's a lot of value in saying, well, maybe I'll keep an open mind and I'll, I'll listen to what people have to say. And and uh, sometimes by not rendering an immediate judgment, you are open to learning more than than you supposed was out there. Something like that. Right. Well, we can't thank you enough for moving us from the maybe table to the yes table uh, and helping us with this book, Brandon. You you are truly a, a dear friend. And, you know. I'm sure anybody who's here tonight and anybody who may watch this has heard of Brandon Mole. You've had like 21 number one New York Times bestselling books. So I can't. Well, n n now you're exaggerating a little bit. Okay. But, 20? <laughs> but, but I have had, a, I've had 18 New York Times bestsellers. Okay. 18, 21. I, I've, had a, I've had a few that hit number one and, 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 and but yeah, I, I've, I've done okay. I, I'm no, no complaints. Um, well, and this is what I love most about you is you're incredibly humble, incredibly humble. Yeah, we're excited for your new one when it get, when it comes out. So I know you're working on it. Like, yeah, I'm working on something cool, a, a, a first book and a brand new series, first brand new story world in about ten years for me. So I'm I'm really excited to share it with people. And yeah, yeah, you'll hear more about that. I don't know next year or something. That is so. Anyways, cool. before you leave, before you leave, oh yeah, I, someone had a question for well, you. It was interesting the, the maybe idea because. A lot of times when I ask women out on a date, they say maybe. <laughs> uh, and they haven't really gone anywhere from then. So is there a way to like figure out a way to like, turn into the maybe yes table? This is being recorded. I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're saying you, the girls are putting you on the maybe table sometimes, huh? 
Not sometimes, Brendan. <laughs> big all the time. They, 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 they keep me on the maybe table. Well, it's very yeah, nice. yeah. Well, yeah. You know, like a, a maybe is better than a no. A, a maybe leaves room for opportunity. You just got to get good at tap dancing on that na- maybe table until you, you know, get enough attention to get over to the yes. I'm like a world class quadro on the maybe table. Yeah. Well, the sad thing, uh, Cherry and I, I, I had you on the maybe table, whether or not I wanted to invite you, but I did move no. you. No. <laughs> you got you got to have Charon because then you get jokes. You yeah, get jokes. You get jokes. That's important. Aliens love jokes. Yeah. You know this. <laughs> I'm having issues with my camera. All right, cool. Well, anybody else want to say anything to Brandon or just, just want to say one thing? So I think this is a very appropriate scene right here with these lights above your head. Go ahead, go back. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. like, oh my gosh, right. Right. Now. right. Yeah, it does kind of look like you guys are having a visitation there. All of those alien lights above us. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Some orbs. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for bringing that out. Cool. Well, Brandon, I know you um, got to leave, but thank you so much. We wish really I could be there. Good to see you guys. Thank you thank very you, much. Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Yep. See you guys. Yay. How much I still regret turning the camera over all the way to me. Just so I, <laughs> I think what I, I knew, I, I was like, I was like, oh, it's going to be so good. Because he's like taking all this effort, all this time to move it over. Uh, okay. You don't need to move it again. You notice I moved it back? I know. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, so, Rick, should we tell him anything about book two? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Book two. Oh, okay. I've got the manuscript open on my desk. <laughs> and it's only 500 pages. 431 so. pages of edited, combed manuscript. Yeah, in 17 and a half hours, we could be done reading it, huh? <laughs> well, the storm's bad outside, so you never know. Um, well, we can talk about, oh my gosh, we can talk about book two. But before we do, um, let's kind of talk about how book one ended. Um, because they're... Spoiler alert. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming people who watch this are going to want to know about, you know. We all know the end. We all know, the, everyone knows the end, so we're not going to okay, talk. Yeah. But the thing is, if we jump into book two, either either way, I guess you could call it a spoiler alert. But just the, so let, let me do this much. So, uh, again, if you... If you're watching this and you haven't read book one, now is the time to turn off the video. <laughs> Thank you very much. Go buy the book and we love you and we'll talk to you afterwards. You can turn on the video afterwards. And okay. if you're like me and you're you're going blind, you can get it on Audible and you can <laughs> listen you to it. There you go. And you can speed it up on Audible too. And That's then it true. will sound like aliens telling the story. So, so what I want to do is just talk briefly about kind of how book one ended. Um, We know that it ended um, not the last scene, but the second to last scene when there was this huge battle um, with the Vol on the ship, the Tienta ship, that is the ship of the um, Enesian. They had stolen the ship and taken over the ship and modified it with this massive weapon uh, that was powerful enough to essentially destroy the planet. Um, oh, I just had a bunch of uh, other ideas pop in my head, Rick, because you mentioned Michael Rush. And now I'm thinking of Michael Rush's new book, his commentary on Enoch. <laughs> and he talks about so many amazing things that have already been written in book two before his book even came out. And that was pretty exciting, Rick, when we started reading his book and we're going, oh, my gosh, this we've already written this. This is going to be in book two. Well, it's good for us and our spouses because they actually believe it. Everybody <laughs> else is in the they copied him, and that's okay. Yeah. Either way, uh, Michael knows the truth. He, he knows uh, I've had so many opportunities to talk with him. It's been fun to tell him things, and, and then he'll tell me something that he's researching or reading, and we'll say, oh my goodness, we, we just wrote about that. So it, it's been really cool. So... Before we start talking about book two, I want to ask the people that are here sitting behind me um, if they have any questions or thoughts about how things will continue in this series. 
for those of you that have read the book, what was what was the thing that was most um, appealing to you about the book? What kept you engaged in reading the book? Life story. Rick, what do we call those? Someone said light swords. What do we call them? They're swords of light. Swords of light. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the swords of light that kept uh, Jason engaged there. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I the two people. I mean, like, well, honestly, it, w it was really interesting because what first kept me engaged was you keep asking me, have you kept, have you kept reading the book? Have you kept reading the book? <laughs> that, kept me, uh, that, that kept me going for a bit. No, um, honestly, the, the thing that I really, really enjoyed was just the battle of like good versus evil, yeah. you know, played out in, in such a magnitude and a, in a big way. And, and I mean, I, what I think, you know, Phil, you don't need to move the camera to me, but, but thank you. No, um, <laughs> but what I was going to say that I, I thought was like so amazing was just the fact that like these beings of light completely put Jesus as a center, even though we, you know, you don't, you don't see it as, you know, what, what, what did you call that? Ma Magic? No. no. Magic. Mandakai. Mandakai, right? <laughs> and um, and I thought that that was like really really amazing and interesting because in a way it, it like really kind of formed like a much bigger galactic picture of really what the whole mm -hmm. of salvation is all about you know and how how it's so important and um, and it's it, it, was, it was really good because especially like because it's it's pretty intense you know it's not like it's not just like a simple read it's a pretty intense read. But especially as it started getting uh, going more and more, I remember just kept thinking like, how in the world are they going to get out of the situation? And and also it's like, how does light prevail when everything seems so dark, mm -hmm. right? So I think those are the things that like really kept me going, getting excited about it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Anybody else? One of the things that we wanted to oh, I didn't hear. Oh, I was just going to say, because I, I said the light sword. sword is light, that, light. is that, oh, Jason? Yeah. Just a little bit louder, Jason, because you're oh, way back there. The light sword, and the sword of light. But Mike and Shabbat, I mean, they, they're obviously central in the way I read that story. And uh, an and evolution or a raising of frequency where one can be. It was just kind of fascinating to watch that play out and the potential, possibly, and our own mankind, so that kind of kept me gripped and the fact that they were there to help and uh, help us along. Um, but I guess my question, you asked if there are any questions, are you going to bring, you had 28 characters that were supposed to be in that first book, are any of those no, no, they, going to be brought into, like any of those that were cut? We didn't, the first book yeah, be brought into we didn't cut, book? we didn't cut any of the characters, we just, just took it out of their point of view. Well, okay, so are you going to, so what's okay, the focus, are you going to switch the focus on some other of those players and beef up their backstory and, and bring us, like, make the world bigger for us so that we can yeah. see it through a different point of view. Rick, did you hear that question? Yeah, mostly. So, the, the, one of the things that she taught us, Erlin taught us out of the gate, and again, I don't want to get too detail oriented here, but um, after she kind of looked at us askance because of 26 point of view characters, she said, So, how many point of view characters are there in Harry Potter? And I says, I guess I don't know. And she said, there's one. Your own, you know, this whole story is told from Harry's point of view. And, and part of the beauty of what she did with, that, with those books was that she's able to pull that off. So that's a sign of a, you know, of a great writer to be able to, to tell a story and allow the reader to come along and learn things as the, as the point of view character learns things. Now, for us, because we're dealing with multiple races on multiple planets in a really big galaxy, plus we did want to, you know, pry open a little bit, maybe some of the thoughts of what's going on of people that are really trying to help us. We really are not alone in the universe, and sometimes it's hard for us to wrap around our minds around, you know, our Heavenly Father, who... This magnitude and grace and beauty and power are so beyond what we can even wrap them you know, that we can even comprehend. So if we can have some really cool figures that are 
that can help us see the universe in a little bit different way than we see it down here. And we can, and probably one of the biggest things for us was we kind of discovered this Perbia thing. I'm glad you, because I wanted to bring that one up. I'm, I'm glad you went into that. So, you Wait know. Minute. I was yeah. told you didn't answer the question about bringing back the characters. Who, who's? So the, the bottom line is that except the ones we kill off, they're all back. What'd you say? <laughs> the ones we kill off are all back? Except for the ones we kill off, they're all back. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. It won't be, it'll be similar to book one. There won't be a ton of point of view characters. That's not, that's not the question. Collective, are you changing the different characters that are point of view characters? Um, I don't believe so. We've got some new characters that will be added in book two as the story goes along. Uh, but I don't think there may be one who, uh, well, I think we've decided there won't be any of them point of view. Uh, during the editing process, Erlin will help. I, I can think of one scene that I wrote with a new character. It, it was in that character's point of view. But uh, after having met with Brandon and Erlin last week for several hours, uh, I, I know how to change that so it won't be in that character's point of view. Is that there is one really cool thing that's happening though, um, and this is real. I think it's really important. And that is that you know Josephi and Connor are both just little boys in book one, and you know Connor obviously is a point of view character and the most important character in the series. Josephi is going to grow up with Connor, with Connor, and they're going to become great friends. And so as book two matures, you'll get more and more inside Josephi's head. But what happens when you do that is that other characters kind of take a step back, not in importance, but, but in point of view, what you don't want to do is have three people sitting at a table in a scene and to tell what's going on from each of their points of view in the same, same chapter. That's nuts. It's sloppy. It's lazy. And, um, and we, Another thing we learned was to get away from the omniscient narration and to and to let our readers kind of go on this journey with us. And and I will say this, working with Phil, is that it has been a journey, and it's amazing what we've learned along the way. Things that you know, going back to what Brandon said about the maybe table. I mean, there there was stuff that we were so sure was right, and there was stuff we were so sure was wrong. And as we went on this journey together, we found out that in many cases it was so much different than we expected. Um, another real big thing for us, and it's so important, is that we really want our friends, our readers, to to realize that really cool stuff is coming. I mean, there's some really hard things too, but. Some really cool stuff is coming, and we're going to see amazing things. And this world is really, really important. And uh, God really cares about this place, and he really cares about us. And um, we, we want people to be somewhat prepared for what's coming so they're not just totally freaked out when some of the stuff starts happening that's just around the corner. And be, I want to go back to Pervia in just a minute. So hold your thought. Um, one of the things that we wanted to accomplish in this series was helping people understand that there is a creator of the universe. It wasn't the Big Bang. It didn't just happen. It was created. Um, and it was created by, by God, by our Father in Heaven. And he created worlds without number. And he placed his children throughout the universe on many of those worlds. And if you accept that concept, and then if you accept the idea that he also gave each of those worlds the same plan of agency that he gave us, and the same plan of salvation to return to him, then they would recognize something important and unique about this little blue marble that we live on. It's the place where God sent his son, where he brought the good news, where he atoned for our sins, where he suffered, 
where he was crucified and where he resurrected. And those events impact all of those worlds without number. And that's probably the most important message that we wanted to get across was that not only are we not alone in the universe, but our planet is pretty darn important to all the rest of them. And if anyone on another world who knew these things had the technology and the wherewithal to come visit the Holy Land or the planet where God walked, they would probably do it in a heartbeat. So I personally am convinced that many, many worlds, beings from other worlds, have visited and continue to visit this world. Now, I'm not talking about little green men or strange creatures. I know there's lots of beliefs and ideas on aliens, but I'm talking about beings uh, that may look just like you and me, and they may walk among us, and we don't know. So that was one of the things we wanted to get across, but we wanted to do it in a way that it wasn't preachy. So getting to Perbia, I think one of the most important concepts that we discuss in the book is pride. But Rick, how many times do we use the word pride in Return from Risa? We don't. <laughs> zero, zero. We never use the word pride because we didn't want to turn off people. And again, you said in the beginning, we kind of wrote this for our kids their generation. We didn't want to turn them off if we started getting preachy. So instead, um, we discovered this concept and this word called perbia that essentially is pride. But we teach it in a way to let people know that's, that's what causes all the problems in the world. That's what caused the problems uh, when there was a great war in heaven. It started with perbia or pride. And when people understand that, um, they, they start kind of going, wow, I, I was at a, a presentation once. No, I was at a group meeting like this, and a gentleman came up uh, to me. I was, actually, I walked up to him. He was talking to a few other people. I think one of those persons is here tonight. And he said, I want you guys to, re I want to read you this really cool quote that I got from a book I just read. And he's reading this thing about Perbia. And he reads this quote about how dangerous it is and how it's the root of all problems. And he says, this is so cool. I keep it with me on my phone and I look at it quite often. And I looked at him and I said, where did you get that? And he said, well, in this book returned from Risa. So I thought it was really cool. And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of had something to do with that. So it was just kind You're of... You're proud, are you, Phil? I was so, pr I was so proud. No, I was not proud. I was pleased that... Uh, that happened. And let me just, since you mentioned that, what we try to talk about, again, without being preachy, there's never, ever a good use of the word pride or pervia. If you say that you are proud of one of your children for something they've accomplished, what you're really doing is you're taking on, um, you're giving yourself the credit for what they did. Because you're so proud that after all the money you spend, all the time and all the efforts of pushing, your child finally accomplished something. There's never been any occasion in all of the scriptures where Heavenly Father introduced Jesus and said, Behold my beloved Son and whom I'm so proud of. <laughs> he never said that. He said, Please. So when you're pleased with someone's accomplishment, you're giving them the credit. You're saying, I am pleased with what you have been able to do. So we try to kind of teach that along with the issues of perbia. Uh, and we did something kind of fun, Rick, you might remember during the editing process. If anybody ever used the word pride, they had to put a quarter in a, in a jar. In jar yeah. <laughs> and uh, should we tell them who said the word pride the most, or should we keep that a secret? Oh, I think that's a secret. <laughs> it wasn't me, so now you guys can whittle it down. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, I kind of lost where I where I was. I shouldn't have said anything about the quarter in the jar. Um, so, uh, so be sure and tell her, Lynn, that you felt the bad that you brought that up. I can't believe you even mentioned her name. People are going to assume it was Erlin that kept using the p word. Okay. Um, so, getting back to book two. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the characters in book one. You mentioned Josephi. 
and a little bit about, we don't have to give away the whole thing, but a little bit about what happens with those characters. And I, I want to start with the spy. And the cool thing about the spy is that we wrote it in a way that we wanted the reader to assume it was somebody else. And most people thought it was Matthew. And most people were shocked when they found out it was his son, Isaac. So Isaac had this horrible experience, did these terrible things, and then became a spy for the renegade or the rogue Anesian and the Vol. And he gave a lot of information that hurt a lot of people. But near the end of book one, he was discovered and he came clean. And then Trava decided that she would help him overcome this horrible case of Perbia. So let's talk just for a moment, Rick, about Isaac. Because when I've heard from people that the three most popular characters that they always mention, Connor, Ektak, and Isaac. And it's kind of funny because when you write a book, you just assume it's going to be the characters that you picked. Um, although those three characters are, are pretty important. But let's talk about what happens with Isaac a little bit in book two. Okay. Um, Isaac's, the, Isaac's journey became exceptionally important to me at a personal level, when one of my dearest friends um, found himself admitting to his spouse of a horrific pornography addiction with some other issues that were going on that caused him to separate and and put him in a horrible place. And I had it, you know, kind of shoved in my face, point blank, of what happens when we really, really, really mess up. And it feels like it's hopeless and there's no journey back. And this dear friend has made an amazing return. It's taken him four years, which is about the time with Isaac, um, is that we see the beginning of his journey. S something else that's really interesting about this whole thing is that when we wrote this book, the opening scene was actually a prelude prologue and that scene <laughs> will be in book three um it's it the way the, the way that it grew and as we got close to you know with book one we realized that we we're gonna have to cut it in half which we did and we got it out so it wouldn't be a thousand page book well what we found out with book two was we once again we had a we had a thousand page book, so we cut it in half. So book three is actually well over half written. Book two, we're just, we're maybe 70 pages of, of finished polished text left to put down on paper. We, we know what it is. It's just a matter of getting it down on paper. And book two covers one year. That was just a huge surprise for us that it, that, but there, some of the issues were so important, and we really wanted our readers to see these journeys that these characters are on. And you see Ektak with this amazing journey that he's about, that he's going to be involved in, and it'll be a major focus of book two. Isaac has a similar journey. Obviously, it's not as well detailed, but there is a, a, a journey for him to come back. And, you know, his goal is to be reunited with his family. And, and let me interrupt. It's the thing I love about with Isaac is it shows that there is forgiveness and there is redemption, and 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 that's important. We want the reader to understand that it doesn't matter what kind of mistakes a person makes in their life, they're still loved and they're loved by God, and they can be forgiven and they can be redeemed, and that is one of the exciting things for me in book two with Isaac, um, because we can all relate at some point with Isaac. Um, that we've fallen short. And sometimes people fool themselves into thinking, I'm irredeemable. It, I can never be better. And that is the biggest lie that the adversary wants you to think, because we can all be redeemed. And that's because, and, and I don't want this to be too religious, but you know, the vast majority of our readers are religious. Uh, that's because of the redemption of Jesus Christ, that we can all be redeemed. 
So I'm, I'm so excited that we're able to continue a little bit. Isaac's not going to be through the whole book, but we're able to continue his journey so that the reader can see that Isaac has been redeemed and he's whole. And again, I think that's so important, especially in our world today. People need to never lose hope of changing and becoming better and uh, frankly being redeemed. So I'm real excited that we're able to do that in book two with Isaac. The other big journey, of course, is Connor's journey. And, um, you know, Connor's this idyllic, wonderful little boy with such an interesting outlook on the world. And the ability to, to teach is adults with very simple concepts that just defy them. However, um, we get to see Connor grapple with, you know, a pretty dark, evil place and and begin his experience with puberty and, and book three will, we think, will cover about seven years. Um, um, so obviously we're not going to dive so deeply in, but the, but book two does so much character development that allows us to really work at a high, you know, at a higher level with, with these main characters as the story kind of gets going again, in, you know, the hyperdrive. So, yeah. And then what we see, you, you've got Connor and Ektak and they're both kind of going in different directions. Ektak is, is going up. Um, with this incredible process of being, um, I don't want to say tested, with being uh, refined. He's being refined by Mandakai to become a better person and to ultimately become a leader for his people and bringing them back uh, to God. So you've got Ektak on this journey going up, and in book two, Connor is kind of going down. Um and the again, the interesting thing, we thought that book two was going to be Connor from age 11 to 18, and it's only Connor from age 11 to 12. Um, so a lot happens in just one year. But we wanted to do it that way to make it as realistic as possible. Instead of just doing one little scene one year, two years later, this happened three years later, because there's you know, that's not how our lives are. Things are happening to us day after day, month after month, year after year. So it was a surprise uh, to see that. Um, I don't I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking a whole lot more about book two. But my question is, um, you've got the manuscript in front of you. I don't. Is there is there a scene in book two that you think would be interesting to read that we could share with people. Now, having done this, um, Berlin can never see this video. <laughs> because if we share stuff that hasn't been edited, um, I'm no longer going to be six foot one. I guarantee you that when Erlene finds out. I'll be the size of x -Pack. I'll be pretty short. Um, no, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But is, is there a scene, Rick, that you think we could share? Uh, in book two that you think would be interesting or fun for the audience? Um, interesting or fun? <laughs> okay, well. No, I mean, Penny, for your thoughts, is that kind of where my head was? Um, All right, well. How do you feel about that? I think that'd be great. Would you guys like to hear one of the scenes? Sure. Okay. This is um, January of 72. So Connor is just about to have a birthday. Okay. It was a brisk Saturday in October with a cold chill in the air as Connor sat next to a stream to toss pennies into the water. He only had ten to throw, so he wanted to make each one count. Somewhere, Connor had learned that you can make a wish when you toss a coin into a stream, a river, or a wishing well, and today he had many wishes to make. When he woke up that morning, everyone seemed to be headed in different directions. His father left to help Andy build a deck, of course, Connor knew that his father and Andy would probably spend the day drinking and not building anything. It was a typical excuse for his father to drink away his past. His mother was headed to get her hair done in town, which usually took most of the afternoon. She dropped off Samantha at a neighbor's house who had a little girl her age. Christopher left with his BB gun to kill squirrels with his friend Frank. Connor would have asked to go, 
just to be with Christopher, but the idea of killing any animal made him sick. Connor sat on his bedroom floor, tying his last tennis shoe, and suddenly his body flung back when something was put over his head and pulled tight. He grabbed it with both hands and fought to remove it, yanking from side to side, pulling against someone else's hands. Get it off, Connor yelled as a fabric pulled tight against his open mouth, making speaking difficult. He heard laughing as the struggle continued. Finally, Connor wrenched the material off his head and, using his legs, he pushed his back against the wall. Rubbing the smell off his face and shaking his head, he opened his eyes and saw Martin rolling on the floor, holding his stomach and laughing. You are such a jerk, Martin, Connor yelled as he threw the dirty underwear at him. Hey, loser, I just wanted to make sure you put your panties on right. Yellow in the front, brown in the back. <laughs> Martin howled, still laughing. First of all, Connor shouted as he threw the underwear at Martin, these are your underwear, and you are disgusting. And second, boys wear underwear, girls wear panties, you idiot. Martin caught the underwear, stood and threw it back at Connor. I know that, you pansy. Connor brushed the underwear aside and stood. At least I don't have to mark mine to know which is front and which is back, Connor replied. Martin punched Connor in the stomach, knocking him to the floor and left the room. Connor held his stomach as Martin yelled, Catch you later, sissy. Have fun with the fairies. His laughter trailed off as he left the house. Connor rolled into a fetal position and held his abdomen tightly until the pain subsided. He sat on the floor and stretched his legs, noticing the, the untied shoe. Connor looked around the room for a minute, then slowly stood. He opened his dresser drawer and, and slid his hand under some clothes until his fingers touched what he was looking for, coins. It was about a 20-minute walk through thick brush and woods to get to a stream. Connor liked a particular spot, a place rarely visited by others. He went there often when he wanted to be alone, and since Connor was alone today, he would rather be there than in the house. He dug his right hand into his pocket and wrapped his fingers around the coins. Pulling them out, he thought about what he would wish for today. It would be cool to have a new friend, but it seemed stupid to wish for a friend. Maybe he would wish for Martin to be nicer to him, but it occurred to him that it would mean changing Martin into a completely different person, and he knew that would never happen. Martin seemed like a lost cause. He would wish for something else, something more probable, like finding a $100 bill on the ground or a new bike, a ride on a train or in a helicopter or an airplane. Connor carefully placed the 10 pennies on a flat rock in a row, all face up. He picked up the first penny, turning it over in his left hand, admiring its shiny copper. He looked at the face of President Lincoln on one side and with the year 1969 stamped on it and the word liberty. Of all the words that could have been put on a penny, he wondered, why liberty? He then remembered his teacher saying that liberty was an early American motto, which meant that every person had the freedom to choose. He then read the other words in God We Trust. He wondered if Americans still trusted in God. He knew he did. Even though God had not made things easy for him, and God had not helped him make a friend or keep Martin or others from bullying him, did he trust God anymore? Connor knew God was real, but it seemed that God had become do too busy dealing with other things, probably more important than him. He wasn't sure who he trusted anymore. He turned the penny over and looked at the imprint of the United States Capitol building with the words, United States of America. He read aloud the words, e pluribus unum, and remembered his teacher saying these words mean, out of many, one. He held the penny between his finger and thumb. He thought about the symbolism of the small piece of copper and its importance to so many people. And now he was about to throw it into the stream and make a wish, even though he knew whatever he wished for was just a wish, and wishes rarely came true. He drew his arm back like a pitcher, breathed, made a wish, and closed his eyes. Just before swinging his arm forward, he heard a voice ask, What would you wish for? Startled, Connor dropped his arm and turned to see a tall man standing on the other side of the stream. What? Connor asked the man. I asked, What would you wish for, Connor? The man said. Who, who are you, and how do you know my name? Connor asked as his heart began to race. He looked beyond the thick wooded trees and considered the fastest path home just in case. You don't remember me, Connor? The man asked. Connor wrinkled his forehead and considered the question. 
The man looked familiar. He was dressed in strange old clothes and a hooded wool coat that hung over his waist. He appeared to be over six feet tall. He had thick, wavy, shoulder-length hair and bright blue eyes. William? Connor asked, unsure. The man smiled and answered, It is good to be with you again, Connor. He remembered William, who had been with him since he was a small child. It seemed like years since he had seen him last. I, I remember you, but where have you been? Connor asked. I never left you, Connor. I've always been here with you, William said. Connor cocked his head and raised an eyebrow and asked, Where? Nearby, William answered and then asked, Have you come here to pray to a different god? What do you mean, pray to a different god? Connor asked. I see you have ten pennies in your palm to toss into the stream, said William. Yes, but what does that have to do with praying to a god? asked Connor. In my day, those who lost their faith in God turned to dark spirits. There was a Celtic goddess called Coventina, the goddess of the water or the fountain. Of course, she had no real power except to deceive the faithless. She was an evil spirit who whispered in men's ears, promising them healing, wealth, and a new start in life. She even promised to bring friends or loved ones into their lives. Those who prayed to her offered her a small payment for her blessing, never more than a few pennies, William said. That is silly, Connor added. I agree, said William. Anything of worth comes at great cost. The lower the price, the lesser the value. Why are you telling me this? asked Connor. Because you are about to toss your coins into a stream and make a wish to an evil spirit that has no power to solve your life's problems. She cannot bring you a friend or make your challenges go away, William said. I wasn't going to make a wish to an evil spirit, demanded Connor. Then who were you going to pay to make your wishes come true, asked William. Connor thought about William's words. He had not considered such things. He wouldn't pray to an evil spirit in place of God. He just wanted to throw his pennies in the stream and hope for the best. Then he realized William was right. Tossing his pennies in the stream and hoping for something in return was making a wish to someone other than God. Now it seems stupid. He scooped up the pennies and looked at William. Here, you can have these. There's only ten cents worth, and it won't buy much anyway, Connor said. William smiled and said, Connor, I do not need your money. I have sufficient for my needs. And the day will come when you will be grateful to God that you have sufficient for your needs. What do you mean the day will come when I have sufficient for my needs? Connor asked, confused. Suddenly a great wind filled the air with leaves and debris. Connor felt William grab his arm hand to wrist. Instantly, Connor found himself floating in the air above a large city. Startled at first, Connor calmed as he felt William's strong arm over his shoulder, apparently keeping him afloat. William pointed to a building below with the words New York Stock Exchange written on its wall. Look, Connor, William said. Connor noticed a large crowd gathering in front of the building, many coming from within the building. They moved closer to the scene. Connor felt the same chill when he made it to the stream. He noticed trees with changing leaves in autumn colors and he recognized it was October. Looking closer, he saw strange-looking cars and trucks on the busy streets. They had smooth edges and a variety of bright colors. Large billboards were everywhere, with movies running from sign to sign and continuing on the glass buildings. He had never been to New York, but from the pictures he had seen, the city looked modern, even futuristic. His musing was interrupted by shouts and screaming coming from the crowds below. More people gathered around the buildings most waving dollars above their heads. He saw police cars with shiny blue and red lights racing through the streets, sirens blaring. One car with the number 51 caught his attention. His eyes were drawn to the front door of a very tall building. The door was glass with a broad golden frame and the number 51 above it. Chaos was erupting everywhere he looked. As he floated in front of one of the glass buildings, he noticed his reflection, and even though William was still holding his arm, he did not see William's reflection. He glanced at William, reassuring himself William was still there. Connor looked back at his reflection and flinched when he saw a much older face, an older man with white hair and blue eyes. He looked away momentarily, then looked back and saw his 12-year-old face again. What is happening? Connor asked, confused and worried. 
The financial markets have crashed and the dollar is worthless, William said. Connor noticed a giant statue of a golden bull in front of the building. The frantic crowds were tightly pressed against it. Suddenly, the bull raised its head toward Connor. It appeared to transform into a living creature. As Connor's eyes grew large, the beast opened its mouth, grunted, and breathed fire at him. Connor instinctively covered his head with his right arm and closed his eyes. Surprised that he felt no heat from the flame, Connor opened his eyes and found himself standing beside the stream, William on the other side. What just happened? Connor asked. How did you do that? I did nothing, Connor, William said. What was that golden bull monster and, and why did it try to kill me? Connor asked. It's the beast the people worship, answered William. But it was a statue. Then it came to life, Connor stated, confused. How can a statue be living? It wasn't living. It is a monument, a shrine to one of the many evil spirits the people pray to, William said. Pray to, asked Connor in disbelief. How could anyone in our day, he corrected himself, in any day, pray to an evil spirit? You were about to, said William. God knows I would never pray to anyone but him. I know he knows that, Connor insisted. William smiled. He knows, Connor. However, as people turn away from God, they look for other things to fill the void of loneliness. For many, that emptiness is filled with worldly treasures, always seeking more riches, often at the expense of others. I have seen many lives ruined due to the pursuit of riches. Good men and women lose sight of what is most important, and they exchange long-term happiness for momentary pleasure. Connor thought about William's words. It had not occurred to him that tossing coins into the water and making a wish was an act of praying to something or someone other than God. And he surely had no plan of wishing to be rich. What would he do with money anyway? Why did you take me to the future, asked Connor. I could tell it was in the future because I have never seen cars and trucks and buses like that. Connor kept talking, keeping William from answering him. What year was it? Was it in October? Will I live in New York? I don't like big cities, especially big crowds. Will I even be alive when it happens? William raised his right hand, causing Connor to stop speaking. Can I speak now, Connor? asked William. Connor covered his mouth with his right hand moved it slightly and said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Connor, I only accompanied you in your vision of the future. I did not take you there. You took me. Connor was more confused by William's reply. What do you mean I took you? This is one of your gifts, Connor, said William. Gift? What do you mean? Connor asked. The gift to see the future, William added. Many desire to take your gift and use it for evil, but they do not understand how gifts from God are given and that his gifts cannot be exchanged or passed on by the recipient. Connor thought about William's words. He did not know if he wanted to be able to see the future. If he could see the future, it would probably make his life even more difficult. He might see things he didn't want to see that could cause him to avoid his future. But if I don't want to see the future, Connor asked, it would be too hard if I knew everything that would happen before it happened. Being a seer does not mean you will see everything in the future. It means there will be times when God allows you to see things you need to see, things that could help you, your family, or friends, William said. But how did I cause you to be in my vision? I am connected to you, Connor. We are family, William said. He then turned as if noticing someone else in the distance. Connor, I must leave now, but I will see you again soon. Wait, I, I have more questions, Connor shouted as William began to disappear. Where are you going? William was gone. Connor considered what William had told him. If Connor had seen a vision of the future, when was it? Was something going to happen to make money worthless? If so, when? He remembered the trees without leaves, believing it was in October. And who was the white-haired man in the window? Connor closed his eyes and tried to make the man's face appear in his mind. The face was fuzzy, but he noticed a shiny pin on the man's collar with the number 51. He then saw the police car number 51 and the door with the address 51. Connor opened his eyes. What did the number mean? And why did he see it three times in three places? Was 51 the man's age? No, he looked older. Who was the man and why did he look familiar? He put his hands in his pocket and pulled out one of the pennies. As he looked at the face of President Lincoln, another vision opened to him. This time he was alone, standing in a white room with no walls or ceiling. 
Suddenly a face appeared off in the distance. They began flying toward him. As the holographic image approached, a fluorescent name materialized underneath it, Washington. He recognized it was George Washington. When it appeared as if the image would hit him, Connor raised his arms before his face, but it disappeared. He heard a loud boom, followed by a constant low drumming rhythm tone. Multiple images began appearing all around him. The images started rushing toward him one at a time. The following image was another man with the strange white wig and the name Adams appeared. Like the first, it flew toward Connor and vanished before hitting his face. Others continued flying toward him. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, and Harrison. But before Harrison's image vanished, a large black X crossed his face. The images continued coming. Tyler, Polk, Taylor. But before Taylor disappeared, another large black X crossed his face. The vision continued with Fillmore, Pierce, and Buchanan, and then it stopped on Lincoln. But not with a black X, but a bloody red X. Connor had learned about the U.S. presidents and that some of them died in office, but did not remember all who died. It seemed that the X's were showing those who died in office. But why a bloody red X on Lincoln? As the images continued, Connor only focused on those with an X. The next was Garfield, another bloody red X, and then McKinley. The following were black X's, Arden and Roosevelt. The next bloody red X was Kennedy. Connor realized each of these presidents died in office. The black, set, black X meant they died of natural causes, and the red must have meant they were assassinated. Other presidents' images rushed toward him. He knew Johnson, Nixon, and Ford, but not the others. Eight more came and stopped on the eight. The image floated for a few moments, and then a black line appeared diagonally from the top left of the image. Connor assumed it would be another black X, telling him a future president would die in office due to natural causes. But then a red X began to appear on the top right corner of the image diagonally until it completed the X. It faded into the number 46 and then into 47. Still, this number had two bloody red X's. Connor felt a chill. He was only two when President Kennedy was assassinated, and he had read about the killings of the others. But now, was he being shown the death of another president in office? Someone from the future? But this was different. At first, it appeared to be death by natural causes, but then it did become a murder. Would the last president in his vision be murdered while in office? The scene changed as a giant calendar appeared before Connor. Several months later, he watched as people in various cities began fighting in the streets. He did not recognize the places. One stood out with a welcome sign that read, Welcome to the Windy City. The fighting seemed more intense than the others. Soldiers came into the streets fighting with unruly mobs. Fires began to engulf the city. Connor saw similar events in other cities in various locations that rapidly appeared one after another. The chaotic scenes concluded with a newspaper headline that read, They've killed the men the people elected. The vision ended. What just happened? It was bizarre. Too much for a 12-year-old, Connor thought. He wanted to tell his parents about the future and how money would be worthless one day. But he knew they would smile and roll their eyes. And they would really think he was a kook if he told them he saw that a future president would be assassinated. William said Connor could see the future, not everything, just those things he needed to see. Connor realized this was not the first time he had dreamt about the future. He often caught glimpses of future events, but until now, he had not realized the significance of those dreams. The dream showed him the future, but not the actual dates in the future. What was the importance of numbers 51, 46, and 47? Connor dug in his pockets and retrieved the pennies. He looked at one of the pennies and noticed the year 1969. He looked at another and saw the same year, and then a third and a fourth penny, all with 1969. He quickly looked at each penny, which had the year 1969. It seemed too coincidental that all ten pennies were minted in 1969. Connor thought what was significant about 1969 was that we landed on the moon. Still, it seemed strange for every penny to have the same year. He looked at the last penny again. While gazing at it, the year changed to 2024. 
and a large X crossed over Lincoln's head. Connor dropped the penny and hesitated before picking it up. He looked at it again. There was no X on Lincoln's head, and the year was again 1969. If Connor did have the gift of a seer to see future events, why would God allow him to see those events with confusing numbers when God knew math was Connor's worst subject? For now, he would go home and save his pennies, hoping that whatever the future brought, he would have sufficient for his needs. I didn't anticipate that's the scene you would pick, but it might even be appropriate for our day because so much is happening right now in our day. And I'm sure many people, including people in this room, have probably considered some of the potential events of this coming year. Hopefully we get the book out before most of those events take place. I anticipate hopefully within maybe a couple months, Rick, you think? Yeah. And then we've learned our lesson. This time we'll have you do the audible before release. I'm going to record the audible version before the print copy comes out. Yeah, because we made, we made a, there's a, there's a second edition that'll be available soon. There was roughly a thousand changes between the book one and what was on audible. So we'll, uh, n now we know why they do all these together release at the same time. Well, it's interesting because um, I did the audio for book one. There's a big difference between writing something and between speaking something. And I didn't even realize when I was recording the audio that I was actually changing things in the script because it seemed more natural uh, to be speaking some of the stuff. So you said that that was over a thousand changes. It was. And they weren't big things. Um, but, but it was better. That's the, it was, that's the thing, Phil. It was better. It was, it was better. So that just told us that our final edit will be when you actually read the book. After Erlin's done, then you'll read it. Then we'll compare that to the manuscript and make the changes, and then we'll release the hard copy. So, Sounds like a plan. Okay. Well, before we turn this off, um, any last things you wanted to say, Rick, to the audience that's here? And, and, and I'm going to edit this and put this on YouTube. Um, I'm curious what they thought. Do you have any comments or thoughts or questions? And Oh, thanks. I don't know if you heard that, but they said that they enjoyed it. Rick, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I wish I was there. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your support. All right. Take care, Rick. We'll yeah, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for watching this, and thanks to those who are here uh, with me personally. I appreciate it. And I'm real hopeful that uh, within a very short time after I post this, that book two of Return from Risa is going to be available. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um,